once you build the infrastructure to capture those free fuel sources and turn them into electricity, you don't have to keep buying sun. You don't have to keep buying water. You don't have to keep buying wind. But you do have to keep buying natural gas and coal and uh, to fuel those kinds of fossil fuel plants. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we have two guests. Our first guest is Dan Sears, who's the conservation director at uh, Columbia River Keeper. He is an expert on the impact of energy projects on water quality and community, including LNG, liquefied natural gas, coal export terminals, and power plants. Our other guest is Judy Barnes, who is co-founder of Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy. So welcome to the both of you. Thank you, David. Thank you for us. Good. Yeah. So, Dan, uh, what we, well, both of you, what we wanted to focus on today is the problem of fossil fuels. Uh, and so, Dan, you're going to address that. And then, Judy, you're going to propose a solution. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so, talk about fossil fuels. What's the problem with fossil fuels? Well, we're in a unique position here in the Northwest where we're being targeted for a massive amount of fossil fuel development. Um, currently, the state of Oregon burns about 3 million tons of coal at the Boardman Power Plant. Uh, that power plant is slated to shut down in 2020. The state of Oregon and Washington combined are now being targeted for export proposals of 150 million tons of coal per year when you add all, all of them up. Uh, that's a jaw-dropping number. It's huge. Um, and basically what it represents is, is our region tries to figure out how to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, we are being viewed as a fossil fuel superhighway mm. for uh, large, high-priced overseas markets. Um, so coal exports is one example of that. The other key example is LNG exports, um, where both in Oregon and Washington, there are major pipelines proposed to take natural gas, you know, fracked out of the Mountain West or Canada, shipped down to Oregon, and to super cool that natural gas into liquefied natural gas, or LNG. Oregonians are very familiar with LNG because of years of fighting LNG import proposals. Now what's being proposed is LNG export on a huge scale, um, up to you know, between two and three billion cubic feet per day between the projects. Um, again, that's a sort of a jaw-dropping number. It's something that should get a lot of people's attention. Um, and so the, the issue of fossil fuels in the Northwest is really um, comes down to, at least at this time, whether we're going to become a major throughway for exporting dirty fossil fuels overseas. Okay. And it, the, be, being an exporter is really a sign, particularly when you're exporting your natural resources, is really a sign that you're a third world country. Uh, n not a manufacturing, not a developed country. That, that's kind of part of my take on, on mm -hmm. that. Uh, would you agree? You know, I would agree that no. that sending these fuels overseas are going to stoke, um, stoke jobs in countries that don't have the same labor environmental standards that we do. And so that's one of the major concerns we had. Um, recently, Senator Wyden from Oregon held a big uh, conference, or basically a panel, um, and he heard from hundreds of Oregonians who said, we're very concerned about the idea of opening up the door for fossil fuel exports while at the same time creating free trade agreements that allow weak labor and environmental standards. So we ship the fossil fuels overseas and we, you know, the finished products come back to us and our workers end up in a race to the bottom mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, in terms of producing right. materials. Yeah. And of course, not only do the goods come back to us, but also the pollution. Yeah, that's a great point, and it's something that we've become acutely aware of in terms of the coal export proposals. Already, uh, a large percentage of the mercury pollution that ends up in the Columbia River system comes from overseas coal-fired power plants. And so, you know, when we ship 150 million tons of coal to Asia or elsewhere, that mercury that's released by burning coal ends up being deposited in the atmosphere and coming right back into our own water system. Um, and so already, you know, you look at um, requirements or uh, suggestions that uh, people who are pregnant, um, children, not eat too much fish because the toxic load in those fish already is a health risk. Um, and so we're very concerned as a public health concern um, that, that this mercury problem 
is going to be exacerbated by essentially opening up the door to a whole new generation of major fossil fuel use. Okay. And certain, certain populations within our population mm -hmm. eat a lot more fish, so they are really uh, going to feel the um, consequences of this. Absolutely. Um, you know, tribal fisher people all along the Columbia River eat much higher rate, they have much higher rates of fish consumption than um, other parts of the population. And so they are acutely impacted by the toxic burden in the salmon they eat. Um, immigrant communities in Portland uh, eat much higher levels of you know, fish, warm water fish from the Columbia and the Columbia Slough because it's a big protein source for those families. Um, and so we're concerned that this is going to acutely impact uh, certain communities that, um, that do eat much higher rates, uh, you know, much right, more fish. Yeah. So there's some equity questions Absolutely. raised by all this also. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, what's uh, the the proposals uh, about the coal terminals? Uh, just briefly outline mm -hmm. what terminals are being proposed, where. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go south to north. In Coos Bay, they're talking about five to ten million tons of coal. That's challenging because the rail line isn't really up to up to snuff at this point. Um, in on the Columbia River, there's a proposal, two proposals at Port Westward, uh, one by Kinder Morgan for thirty million tons of coal per year. Again, keep in mind Kinder the figure. Morgan is Kinder Morgan is a huge infrastructure company. Okay, um, and they so. they have been uh, involved in coal export and coal development terminals elsewhere in the country. Um, so Kinder Morgan is looking at 30 million tons at Port Westward. Another company called Amber is looking at 8.8 .8 million tons at the same site. Those two projects a, are different. Yeah, they're uh, Australian company, That's is right. that right? Okay, That's right. right. So you get a, a feeling for the international flavor of all this. Yeah, and that same uh -huh. Australian company, if you just go right across the river to Longview, uh, the fourth proposal would be 44 million tons uh, in open terminal with big piles of coal, trains coming in. So that's also Amber. Amber has two different projects on each side of the river that look quite different from each other. And you are, are, are they proposing these as one or the other, or are they proposing them as both? They're proposing them as uh, supposedly very separate projects, uh -huh. um, okay. and they, so they look separate because they have very different designs. One would have covered um, coal storage and barges coming down the river, while the other would have open coal trains, open coal piles in Longview. Um, so that's one through four. Number five is Bellingham, Washington, which is a 50 million ton proposal. Um, a huge proposal by SSA Marine, where they're seeking to bring trains all the way through the Columbia Gorge up to Bellingham. Number six is in Hope Ram, um, which is you know kind of in the middle of the Washington coast. And that proposal in Grace Harbor has failed. Um, so far, uh, the Port Commission has indicated they don't want to proceed with that proposal. Mm -hmm. So if you had talked to me a week ago, we've been talking about six. Today, we're talking about five, okay. which is already an indication that we're making progress. Um, the thing to remember about these projects, these proposed projects, is that every one of those coal trains has to come down the Columbia River at some point. We're talking about dozens of dirty, dusty coal trains barreling down the Columbia River Gorge, you know, impacting all the communities along the way. Um, in many instances, dividing those communities. And so the human health impacts aren't limited just to the mercury that people eat in the fish. They're also the diesel exhaust they're breathing from these trains and the fact that their community may have all of their medical facilities on one side of the tracks and most of their elder care facilities on the other side of the tracks, which is the case, for instance, in Rainier, mm -hmm. where the senior center is is right on the wrong side of the tracks. Yeah, and then I've, I've read that in, um, not Spokane, something east of Spokane, where they have one community where uh, most of the people live on one side of the tracks and mm -hmm. the hospital and medical facilities are on the other side. The, mm -hmm. the trains themselves are a mile and a, a, mile, and over, a, a mile and a quarter long, mm -hmm. so we're talking about what, uh, 15 minutes for a train to pass a particular yeah. point. So all of that access to those medical facilities is, 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 uh, is disrupted. Mm -hmm. And in Billings or Spokane, there'd be all of the trains would be going through those points. That's right. Right. Yeah, the source for the coal is the Powder River Basin, um, which is southeast Montana and uh, northern Wyoming. And so that, that basin is basically being um, 
sold at pennies on the dollar um, to Asian markets where you know they, they see a, an opportunity to secure a long-term um, right to coal um, from North America and we're very concerned about becoming that gateway becoming that trafficker mm -hmm. of coal exports mm -hmm. which we we don't want to be yeah and the the other thing that you you mentioned are, are a right mm -hmm. uh, the problem with free trade agreements is that particularly when we're talking about foreign corporations investing in the United States that foreign investor protections, which are in these various mm -hmm. uh, uh, agreements, kicks in. And that has a very different impact uh, on the decision, and particularly afterwards. If you say yes, mm -hmm. some of these agreements say you can never say no. Yeah, and this is a particular concern with liquefied natural gas export. So the other big set of big you know, fossil fuel export projects are a proposal in Coos Bay, Oregon, and a proposal in Warrington, Oregon, to liquefy natural gas coming out of the Mountain West, um, to super cool it down to negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, it becomes the liquid form. And then to ship that in large super tankers all the way across the ocean to Asia, where they pay much, much higher prices for gas than we do. If we, try, if we sign free trade agreements um, with LNG importing nations, uh, the, the Congress has deemed LNG export to those nations to be in the public interest. Essentially, we're tying our own hands. We're, we're saying, um, by the virtue of the fact that we have a free trade agreement with you, it is in our interest to ship you natural gas from Wyoming, Colorado, or wherever else it comes from, Utah. Um, and that is sort of jarring to people, because the real impact of that is pipelines through Oregon and Washington, hundreds of miles of pipeline, huge terminals in very sensitive estuaries where we spent millions of dollars trying to restore salmon, uh, crossing hundreds of streams and rivers across the state, damaging salmon habitat, and then ultimately, we all pay more for gas. What happens when you, know, you open up your market to another market that pays five times the price? Oregon will end up seeing their gas price float up to that, that, global, that mm -hmm. global mark, and that's gonna be a major impact um, on, on industries and people who haven't been typical allies in the LNG fight. Um, so some major industrial customers are coming out and saying, actually, let's hold on a second and figure out whether this really makes sense because if we're paying three times the price for natural gas, all of a sudden our fertilizer, our food processing, um, whatever else we're making is gonna cost a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're seeing actually surprising is we had a very broad coalition fighting LNG imports. Um, and we're seeing that coalition getting even broader with LNG exports because people are so concerned about the price impact. Uh -huh. Okay, so very quickly, what can our watchers, listeners do uh, with regard to both the LNG and the coal terminals? On the coal front, um, it's gonna come down to the state of Oregon, I think, um, to make a tough call about whether or not we see this as the highest and best use of our Columbia River resources. You know, as you look down in the lower Columbia, below Portland, um, we're asking them to take a big look and to consider all the impacts before issuing any permit. And that includes having an environmental impact statement in hand, completed, and adequate before any decision is made. Um, so the governor of Oregon, Governor Kitzhaber, is absolutely critical um, in this decision-making process. And so we're, we've been asking people to contact him, to contact his staff, and to let them know that we're very concerned about these projects. On the LNG front, but it's kind of a rehash. You know, again, it comes down to the state of Oregon. And a lot of this come, you know, is a product of the fact that we're concerned that, you know, what if the federal agencies get it wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, the state of Oregon has been really good about saying, hey, federal government, uh, we want you to do a full, robust environmental impact statement. In fact, we want you to look at all these projects put together because they have a cumulative impact. Um, and that goes with both coal and LNG. What if the federal government says no? Then it comes down to our own state government, to Governor Kitzhaber and his, and his agencies to basically make this really tough call and say, is Oregon gonna be the gateway for these mm -hmm. fossil fuels to Asia? So we'll be asking people in coming months, one, to contact the governor, and two, to a attend federal hearing, hearings when they happen. So there'll be scoping hearings coming up on the coal issue, um, probably in Vancouver, just across the river from here in Portland, and there'll be scoping hearings coming up for the LNG issue. 
uh, both in Southern Oregon and in Northern Oregon. Uh, for more information on that, I encourage people to connect with us at ColumbiaRiverkeeper.org. Excellent. Good. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Great. Good. So let's turn to Judy. Welcome to the show, Judy. Thank you. Thanks Good. very Good. much, yeah. David. So we wanted to, you have been working on a proposal which we're now calling clean energy contracts. So why don't you just start talking about what clean energy contracts are and uh, the effect of those would have on the, uh, for keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Great. Yes, I'm glad you said keeping fossil fuels in the ground um, because ultimately the solution to global warming, climate change, um, is going to be to keep those fossil fuels in the ground. There's way too much already of the greenhouse gases and the mercury, but spe specifically global warming gases um, in, the, in the atmosphere. Um, uh, we're already, we've already, re are experiencing, I think people can see, one degree of warming and that's already changing climate uh, patterns that people can see. Two degrees is already baked in because of the greenhouse gases that are already up there and that are going, we're going to increase temperatures that much. And if we don't do um, something more drastic as a planet, and of course our country and our state has a responsibility to, to play our part in that overall plan, that uh, we're, we're on a track to six degrees of warming, which is actually going to be catastrophic for us. So um, given that the answer to that huge problem is keeping fossil fuels in the ground, um, Dan mentioned that Oregon has done a significant thing by closing our only uh, uh, coal plant uh, by 2020, the Boardman Coal Plant. That was a long fight that was engaged in, and now we have a target date for replacing the imported coal that, you, that is now coming and being used in the plant and replacing that with something else. So that's, that's great. That's great progress. Um, Oregon has already established uh, several years ago a renewable portfolio standard requiring that our investor-owned utilities have 25% of their load by 2025 met from renewables. But there's still a long way to go. Um, and this is how clean energy contracts come in. If you look at Oregon's current energy usage, 42% of that, the energy the, that we use to turn the lights on, for example, comes from hydro. We are blessed with one major clean renewable energy resource, and that's uh, hydroelectric power. We have 3% coming from wind because of the programs we've had in place uh, in, in recent years. But we still have 55% of our energy uh, electricity energy uh, usage in the state coming from um, imported uh, natural gas, coal, and nuclear, and all of those are imported fuels. We don't, we don't, we're not developing any of. We don't have those resources here to develop. So that's money we send out of state to the tune of twelve billion dollars. Okay, so our goal is in, in in what we see is how do we go about replacing. That energy, that 55% of our energy uses, by, by the way, that translates to 2,500 megawatts of electrical power, okay, two and a half gigawatts of power. How do we replace that with renewable energy resources, which we can develop here in Oregon? Because we're blessed with sunlight, water, wind, and a lot of other natural resources here that we could develop stimulate our own economy. What about bringing that $12 billion back into Oregon's economy? That's a huge economic stimulus. Could create jobs and develop resources here. So what would it take? And how soon could we do it? And that's where clean energy contracts come in. And you've had me uh, on, the th on the show before talking about this concept of paying average Oregonians who can produce clean energy to do so and compensating them by the kilowatt hours of energy from a clean source they feed into the grid, whether it's from a rooftop solar array or um, a, f a, f a farmer's uh, ground-mounted uh, uh, solar uh, array or wind turbines um, or a small micro-hydro thing, in a, uh, you know, turbine in a, in a, sm in a small way, um, or biogas from animal manure, which would otherwise uh, leak uh, methane gas into the atmosphere, which is 23 times as potent a greenhouse gas. So how can we tap all those kind of resources and meet our own energy needs and bring that money act into our economy? Well, the, the policy, the way that other places are doing it, and this is proven, it's not just a theory, is to pay, as, as I said, open up the energy market so that average Oregonians can get paid for producing that energy. And there are cattle farmers out in eastern Oregon who could benefit having a secondary income source from not just selling their cattle, but selling renewable energy to the grid, okay? That's what we want to do. And make that opportunity um, happen all around the state. 
and create family wage jobs, develop our renewable resources. And here's an important other benefit that we get by, by moving off of fossil fuels onto clean energy. Clean energy um, sources, sunlight, water, and wind have no fuel costs. Okay. Once you build the infrastructure to capture those free fuel sources and turn them into electricity, you don't have to keep buying sun. You don't have to keep buying water. You don't have to keep buying wind. But you do have to keep buying natural gas and coal and, uh, to fuel those kinds of fossil fuel plants. Okay. So the International Energy Association has said that if in a, as a globe, if we move from fossil fuels as our energy source to clean energy, we'll save hundreds of billions of dollars in not having to buy, continue to buy a fuel source to fuel, fuel the uh, fuel plant, the energy plants. So that will be a savings that we, once we, the sooner we get to that, mm -hmm. the sooner Oregon and our economy can benefit from that, that stable. We won't no longer be dependent on uh, fuel sources which go up and down in price as we've seen with natural gas and coal in the past. So we'll have stable, low cost energy for the, first, for the future, okay? Mm -hmm. Once we, these, these are truly sustainable resources and recirculate those energy dollars into the pockets of Oregonians instead of sending them out of state. So, okay. this is so this how are we going to do this? Yeah, yeah, go, go okay, ahead. the plan is, and our organization's been working on this for three years, to try and translate a policy working in Europe and the rest of the world into working well in, in, uh, in uh, Oregon, which is one of the first states to look at it. It's, it's, it's not being practiced uh, around the country. Uh, we're on really on the forefront. So here's the here's what we're proposing. Okay, and and by the way, this is in debate right now. We're deciding to to in our proposal, uh, which will be in the 2013 legislature. We will have a bill for clean energy contracts, as you said, um, and we have a sponsor for the bill. Representative Jules Bailey will be sponsoring this legislation, and we're designing it now. And we're welcoming input from your listeners and viewers. Um, and here's, here's some of the issues that we're dealing with. How fast do we propose to get there? Um, there are experts now, National Renewable Energy Lab says that the whole U.S. could get, meet 80% of its energy needs uh, by 2050 from clean. Mark Jacobson, a respected researcher at Stanford, said the whole globe could do it by 2030. There's enough resource, it's possible. And how fast in Oregon do we want to go to reach that zero cost fuel? So um, what we think is given, um, given the urgency of climate change, we should be getting there sooner rather than later. Um, two and a half megawatts of energy is what we need to replace, but that's from a continuous source fossil fuel, right? Renewable energy, sunlight and wind are intermittent. So you have to install more of them to equal the amount of continuous source energy you have from fossil fuels. We've used a three to one factor. So we're saying that what we need to do to, if we're going to replace that two and a half gigawatts with renewable energy is uh, set ourselves a target of about seven and a half gigawatts. So 7,500 megawatts as opposed to 2,500 megawatts. So that's the overall target. And this is a ballpark figure. Okay, There's lots of things that would influence whether that's, uh, whether that's exactly how much we need to replace. But that's a ballpark figure. How soon do we want to get there? 2050? Well, we think 2030. We think we should be doing it now. And the sooner we get involved in this transition, the, uh, while energy rates are relatively no, low now, um, they, uh, rather than waiting till fossil fuel prices go up and then have to do it as well, let's do it now. So we're, we're thinking of proposing that we replace, that we, our target should be 7,500 uh, megawatts of renewable energy by 2030. And if your viewers would like to weigh in on how soon Oregon should meet that goal, um, we'd urge them to visit our website at mm -hmm. www.oregonrenewables.com. That's oregonrenewables.com. And send us an email. Uh, do you think we should be waiting to 2050 to reach 100%? Uh, should we do it sooner than that? And um, why and why not? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, wow. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, four more minutes. Uh, do you have another statement, a concluding statement? Actually, I'll ask both of you. Uh, so, Dan, first. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things um, that's really important is you know, the Columbia River Basin, the entire basin, is acutely impacted by climate change. Water levels, water temperature, water quality, all of these things are related to how many, um, how many tons of fossil fuel we're burning in, throughout the world. Um, one thing that was really inspirational I heard on the, on the radio recently was Bill McGibbon getting on the radio and referring to the Columbia River as, as a strategic choke point in terms of making a difference um, about global climate change. He said, you know, we've got a real opportunity here. So with 
kind of the curse of these major fossil fuel companies coming and promising jobs and, and trying to push dirty fuels down the river, we also have an enormous opportunity to, to do something really good, and that's to, to choke off um, a huge new supply of carbon polluting fuels um, into the global market. And so that's where you know, we, we're one side of the coin, and I think Judy is really proposing the other. Right. Okay. Judy? Um, yes. And I, and I think there's another issue that we, is really important that we dra address, is that if we're to transition off fossil fuels onto clean energy, that means that we have to replace the jobs that are currently um, supporting families who work in the fossil fuel industry. And we have to replace those jobs with new jobs. So it's important that we not, the faster we propose to make this transition, the faster we have to replace those, com those uh, jobs mm -hmm. and with, with new, and there's plenty of jobs in the renewable energy industry. The question is the demand for it. Currently, you and I, when we turn on our, our light electric, you know, the uh, lights, okay, we are contributing to the use of fossil fuels. We must begin to demand from our, the, our utilities and our legislators that the energy that causes our lights to go on come from clean sources, that it come from it now, that we stop fossil fuel, and in the Oregon's case, importing them. We're not even, it's not a question of even developing those resources here. We import those, so it's to our benefit in many ways to bring that money back here and, and replace that fossil fuel with, with, uh, with renewable energy resources from our own state and create jobs around the state in the process of doing so. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really question of, uh, you know, how do we replace that jobs? It's another huge piece of the equation. Tell us uh, in 30 seconds. What was the experience in Germany when they first put uh, clean energy contracts in place there in terms of job it, creation? Oh, it massively created jobs. In the first, uh, 2001, the first seven years, they created 250,000 jobs, and, and by 2010, it was 370,000 jobs in the renewable energy sector, in the variety of renewable resources, uh, not just installing them, but the whole supply chain, the manufacturing, the sales, uh, the, you know, the, whole sale, the whole supply chain. Uh, it, in the industry, and that's what we have—a nascent renewable energy industry here. We need to support it, and we could if we were to stop relying on imported fossil fuels and begin relying on our own clean resources. Here. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, David. Right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Good. So we've been talking with uh, Dan Sears, who is the conservation director at, at Columbia Riverkeeper, and Judy Barnes, who is with Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Want to watch an episode again? Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year. Thanks to our crew today for being here and getting us on the air. Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thank you to the audience for watching. We'll see you again next week. Bye.